Section 12 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Cartwright. The Duc de l'Omelette by Edgar Allan Poe. and stepped at once into a cooler climb. Cowper. Keats fell by a criticism. Who was it died of the Andromache? Ignoble souls. De l'omelette perished of an autolan. L'histoire en est brève. Assist me, spirit of Apicius. A golden cage bore the little winged wanderer, enamoured, melting, indolent, to the Chaussée d'Antin, from its home in far Peru, from its queenly possessor La Bellissima to the Duc de l'Omelette, six peers of the empire conveyed the happy bird. That night the Duke was to sup alone. In the privacy of his bureau he reclined languidly on that ottoman for which he sacrificed his loyalty in outbidding his king the notorious Ottoman of Cadet. He buries his face in the pillow. The clock strikes. Unable to restrain his feelings, his grace swallows an olive. At this moment the door gently opens to the sound of soft music, and lo, the most delicate of birds is before the most enamoured of men. But what inexpressible dismay now overshadows the countenance of the Duke? Horreur! Chien! Baptiste! L'oiseau! Ah, bon Dieu! Cet oiseau modeste que tu as déshabillé de ses plumes, et que tu as servi sans papier! It is superfluous to say more. The Duke expired in a paroxysm of disgust. Ha, ha, ha! said his grace on the third day after his decease. He, 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 replied the devil faintly, drawing himself up with an air of hauteur. Why, surely you are not serious, retorted de l'omelette. I have sinned, c'est vrai, but, my good sir, consider. You have no actual intention of putting such, such barbarous threats into execution. No what? said his majesty. Come, sir, strip. Strip, indeed. Very pretty, I faith. No, sir, I shall not strip. Who are you, pray, that I, Duc de l'Omelette, Prince de Foie Gras, just come of age, author of the Mazurkiad, and member of the Academy, should divest myself, at your bidding, of the sweetest pantaloons ever made by Bourdon? the daintiest robe de chambre ever put together by Rombert, to say nothing of the taking my hair out of paper, not to mention the trouble I should have in drawing off my gloves. Who am I? Ah, true. I am Barzibub, Prince of the Fly. I took thee, just now, from a rosewood coffin inlaid with ivory. Thou wast curiously scented, and labelled as per invoice. Belial sent thee, my inspector of cemeteries. The pantaloons, which thou sayest were made by Bourdon, are an excellent pair of linen drawers, and thy robe de chambre is a shroud of no scanty dimensions. Sir, replied the duke, I am not to be insulted with impunity. Sir, I shall take the earliest opportunity of avenging this insult. So you shall hear from me. In the meantime, Au revoir. And the Duke was bowing himself out of the satanic presence when he was interrupted and brought back by a gentleman in waiting. Hereupon His Grace rubbed his eyes, yawned, shrugged his shoulders, reflected. Having become satisfied of his identity, he took a bird's eye view of his whereabouts. The apartment was superb. Even de l'omelette pronounced it bien comme il faut. It was not its length, nor its breadth, 
but its height. Ah, that was appalling! There was no ceiling, certainly none, but a dense whirling mass of fiery coloured clouds. His grace's brain reeled as he glanced upward. From above hung a chain of an unknown blood-red metal, its upper end lost, like the city of Boston, parmi les nous. From its nether extremity swung a large cresset. The Duke knew it to be a ruby, but from it there poured a light so intense, so still, so terrible. Persia never worshipped such. Geber never imagined such. Mussulman never dreamed of such when, drugged with opium, he has tottered to a bed of poppies, his back to the flowers, and his face to the god Apollo. The Duke muttered a slight oath, decidedly approbatory. The corners of the room were rounded into niches. Three of these were filled with statues of gigantic proportions. Their beauty was Grecian, their deformity Egyptian, their tout ensemble French. In the fourth niche, the statue was veiled. It was not colossal, but then there was a taper ankle and a sandaled foot. De Lomelette pressed his hand upon his heart, closed his eyes, raised them, and caught his satanic majesty in a blush. But the paintings! Cupris, Astarte, Astoreth, a thousand and the same! And Raphaela has beheld them. Yes, Raphael has been here, for did he not paint the... And was he not consequently damned? The paintings! The paintings! Oh, luxury! Oh, love! Who, gazing on those forbidden beauties, shall have eyes for the dainty devices of the golden frames that besprinkled like stars the hyacinth and the porphyry walls? But the Duke's heart is fainting within him. He is not, however, as you suppose, dizzy with magnificence, nor drunk with the ecstatic breath of those innumerable censers. C'est vrai que de toutes ces choses, il la pense beaucoup, mais... The Duc de Lomelette is terror-stricken. For, through the lurid vista which a single uncurtained window is offering, lo, gleams the most ghastly of all fires. Le pauvre Duc. He could not help imagining that the glorious the voluptuous, the never-dying melodies which pervaded that hall, as they passed, filtered and transmuted through the alchemy of the enchanted window panes, were the wailings and the howlings of the hopeless and the damned. And there, too, there, upon the ottoman, who could he be? He, the petit maître, no, the deity, who sat as if carved in marble, et qui sourit with his pale countenance, si amèrement. Mais il faut agir, that is to say, a Frenchman never faints outright. Besides, his grace hated a scene. De l'omelette is himself again. There were some foils upon a table some points also. The Duke s'échappe. He measures two points, and, with a grace inimitable, offers His Majesty the choice. Horreur! His Majesty does not fence. Mais il joue. How happy a thought! But His Grace had always had an excellent memory. He had dipped in the Diable of Abbé Gaultier. Therein, it is said, que le diable n'ose pas refuser un jeu de cartes. But the chances, the chances! True, desperate, but scarcely more desperate than the duke. Besides, 
Was he not in the secret? Had he not skimmed over Père Lebrun? Was he not a member of the Club Vinteux? Si je perds, said he, je serai deux fois perdu. I shall be doubly damned. Voilà tout. Here his grace shrugged his shoulders. Si je gagne, je reviendrai à mes ortolans. Que les cartes soient préparées. His grace was all care, all attention. His majesty, all confidence. A spectator would have thought of Francis and Charles. His grace thought of his game. His majesty did not think. He shuffled. The duke cut. The cards were dealt. The trump is turned. It is... It is... The king! No! It was the queen. His majesty cursed her masculine habiliment. De l'omelette placed his hand upon his heart. They play. The duke counts. The hand is out. His majesty counts heavily, smiles, and is taking wine. The duke slips a card. C'est à vous affaire, said his majesty, cutting. His grace bowed, dealt, and arose from the table en présentant le roi. His majesty looked chagrined. Had Alexander not been Alexander, he would have been Diogenes. And the duke assured his antagonist, in taking leave, que s'il n'eût été de l'omelette, il n'aurait point d'objection d'être le diable. End of section 12